our next speaker is Justin Tallon. Uh, Justin is a veteran at SRS. He's been there since uh, very near the start. As a software engineering manager, Justin leads uh, satellite systems research and development work, as well as the ORAN RIC interface development. Uh, Justin holds a PhD in electronic and electrical engineering from the University of Dublin, Trinity College. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, yeah, so just a note, um, I, when I originally prepared this presentation, I put in a lot of kind of introductory stuff just to set the scene about the E2 and the RIC in general. But after the conversations I've been having all across the morning here, I realized that a lot of you know a lot about the RIC and a lot about the E2. So apologies if I'm preaching to the choir a bit here. But um, yeah, I'm going to start off with the basics that you all probably know much better than me. So we're just going to go through briefly, what is a RIC? What is an E2 interface? And then talk briefly about the E2 service models. And then we're going to go into how the E2 is implemented in SRS RAM project and how you can go about using, using the E2 in our, in our software. So yeah, this is just a diagram that everyone's familiar with just to set the scene. The RIC connects to every network element via the E2 interface. So I'm just going to skip over this quickly. Um, yeah, so we're just going to define quickly what a RIC actually is. So a RIC is, well, there's two types of RIC. There's the near-time real-time RIC and the non-real-time RIC. We're going to be talking about just the near atom RIC uh, uh, for now. So the idea that of the real-time RIC is it observes and controls RAN elements and, and optimizes them over the E2 interface. Uh, it has a time scale between 10 milliseconds and one second, and it's made up of uh, four key components. So there's a conflict mitigation, which is to manage the, um, manage the different XAPs uh, instructions and make sure they don't contradict each other increase one X app increasing MCS, the other decreasing it just to make sure they don't have these kind of conflicts going on. This is a subscription manager, which like manages the interface between the X apps and the RAN functions that exist in the, that are uh, enabled by the E2 agent. Uh, this is a security system, which prevents malicious X apps from leaking sensitive RAN data or sabotage, deliberately sabotaging the RAN. And then there's the X app management, which manages the X apps life cycle, uh, provides APIs and SDKs for X app developers. And just the one thing to note about this is that currently it seems that XAPs and RICs are tied to each other and are not yet interoperable. It's something that I've, a conclusion that I've come to over the course of the development over the last year. And so currently, if you want to develop on the ORNSC or on, say, VMware's uh, RIC, you need to use their SDK and use their way of making XAPs, which is quite limiting. And it's something that I hope that the, the ORAN Alliance address in the future, because it would be great to be able to use any XAP with any RIC, but currently that doesn't seem to be possible. So uh, just a, a brief note about an XAP in case no, nobody knows. An XAP is an application that basically uses some AI or some machine learning intelligence to optimize the RAN based on some observations and using some exposed parameters in the RAN. So yeah, just going on to the E2 interface is the, uh, the pipe by which the RIC uh, acts upon the on the RAN and vice versa. So there is so there is a, an E2 connection to each RAN element as to the DU, to the CU, CUCP, and to the CUUP. And the actual protocol itself is split between two functions. The E2 app is the, the plumbing and like manages the connection between the two. And then the D2SM is the actual, like the business domain, the business logic that like does the actual RAN talk with the with the RAN. So um, just skip on there. So the way that an E2 interface will be set up with a, with a RIC is that it will define its capabilities to the RIC using this RAN function. So this is an important aspect of the connection because it defines like the, these service models are huge. They provide a wide range of, range of functionality that could never be totally supported by any one RAN. So the idea of this RAN function definition is that your specific RAN, your E2 agent, tells the RIC uh, using this structure what's possible in this particular uh, RAN. So if each, you'll have a RAN function for each service model, although you could have multiple um, RAN functions for a service model. And this will say, we support, say, the KPM model, and we support the report service, and we support just these 10 metrics, say. And that's, and that's telling the, the RIC not to ask for anything else except for that. 
So it's moving on. So yeah, what I have here, just going down the weeds a bit more, this is like a PCAP of this kind of message. And it, the, the purpose of this is just kind of show you the difference between the E2 app and the E2 service model. So here is like the kind of message structure of this E2 app message. And then you can see that, that here, the RAN function definition is actually just seen in the E2 app as just a hex string. So that is then passed into a separate decoder, which is defined for the specific service model. And they all have their own ASN1. So you, once you unpack the E2 app message, then you have to find out what E2 SM it's using and take that RAN function and then unpack that itself. And then that defines the, the actual RAN mess, the, the, the service model you're using. You can see in this case, it's the, it's the KPM and each of these um, KPNs has this kind of OID, which is this uh, like unique defining number that tells uh, that tells the, the RIC which uh, service model this is using. And then it goes down to define different things like the event trigger and the different report styles. You can see here, actually, this is from the RNSC and it, it's using a report style that doesn't actually exist. So you can see a lot of these implementations are, are very raw at the moment. And also what you can see the Wireshark, even though this is a correct message, it's complaining about it because some of the, the uh, older versions of Wireshark haven't, haven't kept up with the E2, um, the E2 message packing and unpacking. So you have to get the right Wireshark version if you want to be able to look at these matches properly. But I'll I'll get to that. I'll tell you the version that you need. It's not you have to compile it from source, but it is out there. So these are the different service models. Um, the kind of mo most developing the KPM. This is the key perf performance metrics. This is basically a metric extraction from the stack as you to pull out a wide range of metrics across a number of different uh, service styles. And then there's a remote control um, service model. This allows you to make changes and control different aspects of the RAN stack from the RIC. And then there's the other lesser known ones like the, this is the network interface one that basically allows you to just take raw messages off different interfaces like the X2 or the F1 for your use for whatever reason your X set might have. And then there's the newest one. This is only on the first version. It's called the, the CCC cell configuration and control. Um, from what I can tell, this is basically like the remote control, but for like cell level stuff. So as opposed to like the remote control is like doing UE, UE level um, uh, reconfigurations, the cell configuration control is doing cell level stuff, like maybe changing the PCI or, or something like that. But it's only on version one, so it's not very well defined yet. So just having a, a little more of a deeper look at the, these different service models, the, the KPM only does a report service, but it has five different styles. The different styles are doing things like reporting on the E2 node as a whole, or maybe a specific UE or maybe a specific UE that meets these certain requirements or all UEs. So these are the different styles for those different types of reporting that you might want to do. Uh, and then the, the RC service model, there's too many actions or to even go through, but uh, just to say that it has all of the styles, all, all of the services that are possible, like report, insert, control. These are allowing for you to like set policies or extract information only when a certain criteria is met in the stack or, or different things. And there's, there's a lot, there's a lot in it. Um, for the moment, we're only gonna be focusing on the control aspect of the RC control model. It's the main point of the service model. So just looking at the control service model in a little more depth that allows a wide range of these kind of actions, things that radio bearer control, like changing the QoS of a bearer, radio resource allocation control, like changing things in the scheduler, changing the CQI used, uh, even things like setting PRB quotas. That's actually one of the things that we actually already support. Things like handover initialization. You can do load balancing and initialize handover. Radio access control. You can re directly release UEs or like set different backoff indicators uh, uh, as, you, as you see fit. And then other, other things like dual, dual connectivity and carrier aggregation control, modifying how your carriers work. Um, so yeah, just moving on to how this is played out in our stack specifically. So we started off, we've got the basic procedures, the setup, reset, indication procedures, and then we've, we've developed the two, the two main uh, service models, the KPM and the ORC. The KPM is more developed. The ORC is still in its infancy. We have just a couple of parameters, but the, the plumbing, the architecture is there. So like adding more parameters will be easy and you should see more being added in the coming weeks and months. Um, in terms of what metrics we're actually currently supporting, what we've basically done is we're ta we've taken the existing, existing scheduler metrics that are already being reported, and we're just, we created this like metrics hub that anything get, that gets reported to be printed on the screen is also getting sent to the, this E2, uh, E2 node. So anything that is already in that existing scheduler metrics, you can get from the E2 as well. And then we've also um, 
added a load of uh, or, uh, ORLC metrics. So we're monitoring all the ORLC, SDU and PDU traffic drop rates and um, the kind of stuff you'd expect to see from the ORLC. And we're also piping all that in. So those are the, the, main, the main features added so far with regards to the KPM. So yeah, no, here I have like a high level kind of architecture just to, to delve down a bit more of the, um, the actual E2 agent. So this, is, this will sit at each individual network component. This will be at the DU and there'll be a separate one at a CU and the CUCP and CUUP. They have, a, they have a kind of an object for all of the major procedures like the setup procedure, the subscription procedure, and then the kind of core kind of management uh, objects like this, uh, the subscription manager and the E2SM manager. So the subscription manager handles the subscription requests coming in and out, obviously starts the subscriptions, stops them. And it also means a database of what is and is not possible in the RAN stack. So it, it, it takes that RAN, RAN uh, functions from the setup request and, and uh, keeps a database of what's possible so it can reject subscription requests for the wrong kind of thing coming in. And then the E2SM manager just manages all of the, the ownership of all of the E2SM objects that are required for, for different tasks. So yeah, just uh, as we're, as we've been discussing previously, the um, the setup procedure is the one that establishes what is, is and is not possible between the RIC and the E2. So uh, it's actually quite important. So I thought I'd just like run through what the setup request looks like procedurally here quickly. So when we do an E2 setup request, we obviously send that setup request to the RIC and the RIC processes that. But what we also do at the same time is we set these candidate RAN functions in the E2SM manager. So then when the RIC decides, yes, I've checked these RAN functions. I want to subscribe to this one RAN function. When it sends its response and the procedure is completed, we then update this E2SM manager with this, these are the RAN functions that this is, this is going to actually be used. And then at that point, we set up this database in the subscription manager. So that way only so RAN functions that have been agreed to by both the RIC and the E2 will be available. And if anything else is requested, it will be rejected. So, yeah, moving on. So yeah, so the the E two um, K, the KPM is the the most developed of our service models. So the, the architecture is the most complicated. I'm sorry about this spaghetti di spaghetti di UML diagram. I'm not going to attempt to unpack this uh, block by block, but just to say that the um, the key aspects of it are the subscription manager indication procedure and the report service. So when a subscription comes in, the the subscription manager will use the indication procedure and the report service to extract metrics from the stack and send them to the RIC based on whatever that uh, action is. And then the report service manages the actual interface between the RAN stack and the, uh, and the E2. So yeah, I'm just gonna go through this procedure like in a kind of a simpler way, just to make it easier to digest. So the, the, the subscription request will come in and will be sent to the subscription manager. The subscription manager will check if this particular action is supported. And if it's not, it'll just directly send a subscription failure. If, it's, if it uh, decides it's supported, it'll then start the indication procedure. So this is a separate procedure that's managed by the subscription procedure. And when that indication procedure is started, based on the action, it will set up the particular report uh, style type that's required. So that's then like a, and one of these five uh, report styles that we uh, discussed before, a different object is instantiated depending on the report style. And then once that's set up, the indication procedure then executes every X milliseconds, uh, depending on what's dictated by the action. It can be as low as 10 milliseconds, as, as slow as one second. And this will execute every time extracting this metric and reporting it to the RIC until something changes, until the subscription delete request is received or some other, um, some other criteria that ends the subscription is met. And then at that point, um, it will end the procedure and return. So yeah, so this is the, the architecture of the, the ORC stuff. This is newer and therefore simpler to go through because it's, uh, it's in its infancy. So even though it's actually a much larger service model and more complicated, we only have the control service so far. So one, like once we add the insert, uh, we'll require us to introduce the subscription architecture to this service model and that'll make it a lot more uh, complex. But for now, it's relatively straightforward and easy to see how it works. So basically the RIC procedure simply accesses the RIC limitation object through the E2SM manager, and then uses it to push the new parameter to the DU interface. The kind of the, the interesting part of this process isn't really in the E2 agent side, it's in what happens in the RAN stack as a result of what you do here. So it's how this 
this uh, reconfiguration is managed, it's, it can have a lot of negative consequences to your RAN if you just willingly change a parameter. So like how that's managed is the kind of the key part of this. So that's what we're just going to go through here. So the way it'll work basically is the RIC control request will, based on the action, will acquire the appropriate interface to, to access the to access the DU, but the actual process will be pushed into a async task queue, which will run a coroutine actually on the D DU manager. And this, this will allow the, the procedure to be run sequentially and run correctly and for these different control procedures not to conflict with each other. So once that is running in the DU manager, that activates an existing architecture that we have. Um, these like handle UE configuration requests, these are used for various other parts outside of the E2. So we, could, we were able to leverage that existing architecture with this, uh, with this procedure. And that will basically start that coroutine and then that will exit back and then return to the continuation of the procedures, other procedures going on the E2. And then we'll only be woken up again. Once the procedure has been completed, it'll wake up our uh, RIC control procedure and let it finish off. And then only then will the next um, uh, RIC control procedure be allowed to execute using this uh, async task queue. So yeah, so what I just have here is some practical instructions about how you guys can go about actually using the E2 with the SRS RAN, because I know a lot of people here are actually interested in getting their hands dirty with this stuff. So what we have, and we have an app, we have an app note on our, on our website detailing this, but this is kind of just a list of the, the basic components that you need to set this up yourself. Like just obviously a PC with uh, Ubuntu, our SRS RAN project, and then uh, uh, a UE to use. We've been using our own UE, but you can use a COTS UE as well if you want. And then just a zero MQ and the FlexRIC. The FlexRIC is a, an, another open source project that provides a, a near real time RIC, a very simple one that just executes in a command line. You don't need to set up a Kubernetes cluster or any of that crazy stuff like you do with the RNSC, but it's a lot more limited, right? So, like, that's the kind of trade off. But the reason that we use it is because its X apps did the things that we needed for our tests. And this is just what it like, goes back to the point I was making about it. It's a pity that we can't use the RNSC, which is a lot more developed, with the X apps from the, the FlexRIC because they have the better Flex, they have the better X apps. So there's this interoperability problem that we ran into, but this is where we are for now. There are people on our, our mailing list who have gotten up and running with the RNSC and their own X apps. So like there's just, it, it is it is out there that um that integration as well. We just haven't got an app uh, an app now written for it. And uh, here you have the um, the Wireshark version, actually. So that's like 7.407, I think, for the latest Ubuntu, you still need to like download the source version and compile it yourself because the um, the app get version of Wireshark is, is 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 younger than the or is older than this, so it won't do the E2 messages. So yeah, this is the where the rubber meets the road. This is what we currently support. So we've got the CQI or SRP and or SRQ. These are just test metrics that we introduced to kind of prove that the plumbing works end to end. But in terms of stuff that's actually useful for people, we've got ma ma mainly um, metrics related to like packet success rate, throughput, packet drop rate, total transmitted volume, just like basically RLC, SDU and uh, PDU statistics that you can use to kind of assess the performance of your network. And then on the RC side, so far, we just have two, two metrics, the, uh, the minimum PRB policy ratio and maximum PRB policy. Oh, they actually both say min, that's a typo. Uh, but, but that basically means you can set the, like the maximum minimum PRB by index that can be used by an individual UE. So you can just sell a UE, you can only use one PRB. So it's just a quick and, and dirty way to like basically be able to set your own scheduler like in terms of frequency for like given UE. So if like you wanted to stop, like allocate half your spectrum just for one UE to give it better throughput, you can set it to zero, every, everyone else to, to 50 to 100 and then it, let it take the bottom uh, the bottom half. I think that's the, was the purpose of these, uh, the introduction of these RCs. But one of the things that we, we want, just the, the last point here is, this is a work in progress and there's so many metrics and so many uh, parameters out there that we are very interested in hearing what you, the users, actually want implemented to give us a bit of direction because there's just so many to choose from. It's impossible to know where to start. So the more you ask for a specific metric and if loads of people are asking for it, that's more likely to get implemented first. So please send us an email or you can just come up and say it to me in words uh, what, what metrics you're interested in, what parameters you're interested in. And if enough people ask for them, we'll make that a priority. 
And I just have here a couple of like practical tips for the actual debugging and usage for the uh, for the E2 with SRS RAN. I've just taken these from the mailing list. These are kind of common issues that people have been having. So not just not setting up your RAN function definition correctly. Um, people, there, there's, there's also this thing where the version 1.0 of the E2 SM KPM is deprecated now. So like it's like 2.0 isn't a addition to 1.0, it's a totally new structure. So like if you use 1.0 with, with, with a stack that's using 2.0, it totally won't work. So that's a, a common problem people have been having and a lot of the, the other open source uh, projects related to this are still using the KPM version one. So the message just won't make sense to us if we're using the version two. Um, and Oran have said they're actually deprecating version one. So it's not a matter of being backwards compatible. They're, they're saying don't use it. So just don't use it. Um, yeah, and there's just like simple practical stuff like you need to set up, set up your E2 bind address to the interface that's facing the RIC if you're using a RIC on an external machine. And that's caused a surprising amount of people a problem. So I just stuck a note on there just for a reference for people. And uh, that's it. I think we have some time for questions. If anyone has a thing. Okay, thanks very much, Justin. Um, I appreciate you doing that presentation in between low Earth orbit satellite passes. <laughs> um, Justin certainly has a heavy workload at the moment. Any questions on Rick Nitu? I think you answered this question, but uh, do you plan on integrating over NSC Rick in the future? Well, yeah, we have, you know, anecdotally, we've done it ourselves just like through testing, but we haven't like done it rigorously to the point where we've written an X app about it. But then also there are people out there, like it does work, but you might need to tweak a few things. Like it mightn't work like perfectly out of the box, but it is broadly supported. You just, you might have some small integration problem and just send us an email. We should be able to point in the right direction. But there's people on the mailing list who have done it. So you can see if you, if you just search the mailing list, you can see discussions about it and people helping each other on getting it set up. So it, it... Any other questions? No, okay, so we're- Can I ask? all of you a question what ricks are people using besides the two ricks that i have mentioned for their their testing in this in this space is there any other ricks out there that people are using besides the rnsc or the flex rick oh i see yeah okay oh a i see okay Okay. Okay. Just, yeah. Wanted to know. Okay. I uh, see the non real time Rick doesn't actually interact directly with any of our components. So we're probably not going to work on it just because I mean, there's a, there's the real time Rick, which we don't have our own of in between the non real time Rick and us. So we, we probably aren't going to focus on it anytime soon, but that's a better question for Paul than me. Yeah, it doesn't have a direct interface to the RAN stack, so it's not a priority at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go to break and we'll come back for a panel session in about 30 minutes. Thanks very much.